Hi everyone, welcome to this class where we'll be looking at assets and bases in one shot. So this will be a great uh, revision for you uh, on the topic of assets and bases. Please make sure you guys watch the earlier videos on what is an asset, what is a base. And in this class, we are going to cover both assets and bases in the asset base salt chapter. So keep your pen and paper ready and let's dive into it. Before we begin, I just want to quickly say do check out the other courses on our website and our Android app. Do share it out with your friends. Make sure you have subscribed to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So stay connected with Manocha Academy and keep on learning. So can you guys tell me which category do acids and bases come under? You know, uh, matter can be divided into pure substance mixtures. Pure substance can be divided into elements and compounds, mixtures as homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture. Where does acid, bases or even salts come in? So please understand, they all acids, bases, salts, these are all compounds. Definitely they are not elements, they are made from elements, right? So acids, bases and salts all come under the category of compounds. They are compounds as we'll see. Now let's uh, compare the properties of acids and bases. What is the taste? So think of a simple example, you have tasted an acid, right? Uh, obviously not the strong acids, but you have tasted uh, a vinegar or you have tasted lemon juice it clearly has a sour taste now don't go around tasting acids right uh, so acid has a sour taste what about bases bases typically tend to have a bitter taste it is easy to remember b for base b for bitter sour you know acid right you have tasted corrosive are they corrosive yes Co what is first of all what is the meaning of corrosion Corrosion means it eats up the substance. For example, if you take acid and you put it on sponge or you know some uh, rubber material, it will eat up through it. Highly dangerous. Okay, so acids are definitely corrosive in nature. What do you think about bases? So if you ask this question, are they corrosive? The answer is yes. What do you guys think about bases? Are they corrosive? It seems like you know acids seem dangerous. Bases seems bases are mild. No. Bases also like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, they can also be dangerous. They are also highly corrosive in nature. What about do acid and base solution conduct electricity? You can do a simple experiment, dissolve an acid in, wat uh, in water or a base in water, you know, uh, have these conductors use a battery and see if the bulb is glowing. Is it conducting electricity? The answer is yes. They are good conductors of electricity in solution form. And as a result, they are known as, because they are good conductors of electricity, that is why we use the term electrolyte. They conduct electricity. Why do they conduct electricity? They are good electrolytes due to the presence of ions, as we'll see. Because you need charged particles. And what are the charged particles here? Not electrons. They are basically ions in the solution. Now, how do you test acid and base? You shouldn't always uh, taste it because it is highly corrosive, you know. It can burn your tongue or very bad for your stomach, right? So, the strong acid, right? Mild are fine. Uh, so, how do you test them? Basically, we use what is known as indicator test. We use these uh, materials, uh, we use these chemicals such as litmus, methyl orange, phenolphthalein, turmeric and see what is the color change. Like for example, litmus, you should remember, blue litmus turns red for acids, right? blue turns into red for bases red turns into blue it is exactly the opposite methyl orange methyl orange the neutral color and neutral color of litmus is purple okay uh, but it turns red for acids blue for bases methyl orange as the name suggests it is orange in color the neutral color is orange but when you add a acid to it acid turns red it makes it turn red just like litmus for the bases it turns yellow Phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein, when it is uh, neutral, it is a colorless liquid. In acid, it remains colorless. But when you add bases, it becomes a nice, pretty colored pink here. Yeah. So these are all indicators, you know, just like turmeric. Turmeric is called haldi in India, right? So haldi is the neutral color is yellow. It remains yellow in acid, but bases turn it red. Okay. Red cabbage. Red cabbage, as the name suggests, it will neutral color will be red. It remains red in acid but turns to green for bases. So these are this is a very important chart. These are given in your books or I have given it here. Please do not take this lightly. Make sure you learn these colors because they ask very basic questions. You know, they may ask a certain substance, you know, changes turmeric to red. What is it? An acid base or neutral? You should know from the color. So those are color indicators. You can also have olfactory indicator. What is the meaning of the word olfactory? We use olfactory senses for basically our nose, right? 
so these are basically the smell indicators olfactory means the sense of we are using our nose smell for example if you take uh, onion in acids the onion smell remains and this you can remain uh, you can remember because you know in restaurants you have seen they put uh, onion and vinegar you like that taste of onion dipped in vinegar because vi vinegar gives it a sour taste and here the onion smell remains it's there but what happens for bases bases basically destroy the onion smell so the smell of onion it just disappears goes away right similarly bases destroy the vanilla smell vanilla essence smell is very good right it has a very good smell uh, but the for acid the pleasant smell remains in fact you know the vanilla essence reminds me that's how i detected i had covid so during covid time you know i i found that i'm not able to smell things even though my i'm able to uh, i mean my nose is not blocked okay so for example i was not getting the smell of soap i i thought that something's going wrong so i went to the refrigerator and took out that vanilla essence which they put in the cakes and you know i opened it and i brought it near my nose so i'm using my olfactory senses and there was no smell i was 100% sure i had covid and then with the covid test you know it came out as covid positive i knew the simple vanilla essence gave me that uh, test that i had covid because my nose was not blocked so this is what you know the pleasant smell remains for acid but bases will destroy the vanilla if you add a base to it the vanilla smell will go away so now let's answer this question what are acids we know that acids are sour they are very corrosive you know they turn blue litmus to red and all of that but basically how do we define acids acids are compounds which basically contain one or more hydrogen atoms okay so what are acids acids are basically they are compounds that contain one or more than one hydrogen atom and when they are dissolved in water they end up producing this uh, so we should write it like this here h3o plus ions they end up producing h3o plus ions as the only positive ions so looks like a very fancy definition right so let's try to understand this for example if you dissolve lemon orange juice or lemon juice in water it's going to produce high this h3o plus ions or let's take the simple example of hcl so when i take you know water so when i take hcl with water what happens is hcl is hydrochloric acid water is going to break it down into h plus and cl minus ions what is h plus hydrogen ions and cl minus is called chloride ions so as you can see based on the definition hydrogen is a uh, acid is a compound which contains one or more hydrogen atom is that true hcl is having one hydrogen atom now when you dissolve it in water it breaks down into h plus and cl minus note the difference here on the left hand side it's a compound compounds are neutral like atoms right there's no plus minus i've written but water is breaking it into charged particles which are called ions so it breaks it into a positively charged particle h plus and cl minus can you see that split is happening h plus and cl minus okay now the interesting thing is that this h plus which is produced in water reacts with the water so h plus reacts with the water to produce hydronium ion the h3o plus ion so what happens is that this h plus goes and reacts with water to produce your h3o plus so this is the simplified equation we can write it this way hcl is reacting with water where it takes away the h plus ion so it's going to basically give me an the reality is h3o plus plus cl minus please note that this is the simplified equation and this is what is really happening this is the real correct equation hcl reacts with water to produce h3o plus hydronium ion and chloride ion so note the difference in words here h plus is called hydrogen ion this h3o plus this is known as hydronium ion and this is the indication that yes this is an acid because the acid's property is it must produce hydrogen ions or what we or more correctly hydronium ions when they are dissolved in water because the best part is all acids are soluble in water so when you dissolve it in water it produces hydronium ions as the only positive ions no other positive ion should be produced by the acid it only produces hydronium ions and another way we know 
acids basically neutralize bases. You might have heard of the famous reaction acid plus base is uh, salt and water that is a neutralization reaction. So another way to define acid is those guys who neutralize bases. Clear? How is the hydronium ion produced? Again I am reminding you here H plus combines with H2O. So this H plus which was produced quickly combines with the water to give you your H3O plus. This is the important guy for the acid hydronium. So basically when you are feeling that sour taste right or that corrosive nature it is due to the presence of hydronium ions that is what makes the acid and where does the hydronium ion come from because acid must have atoms of hydrogen so if you show me a compound like carbon dioxide which is not having any hydrogen in it is it an acid no right so every compound uh, every acid must have hydrogen but water is not an acid it is H2O so it's not necessary if you have hydrogen it will be an acid but acid must have hydrogen clear so we discussed the basic thing about what are acids now let's talk about what are bases just like we said acid neutralize bases similarly bases neutralize acid or one very easy way to define them is they neutralize acid so they are the chemical opposite of acids okay because bases are not that easy to define we can't say oh it produces uh, hydroxide ion only no because bases the list is a little more what are bases they are basically metal oxides metal hydroxides and ammonium hydroxide can you tell me why i've written this separately why i'm not just simply saying metal oxide metal hydroxide why have i written nh4oh which is ammonium hydroxide separately because nh4 is a special ion it is an exception it is made of non metals but this non this ammonium hydroxide behaves as a base so that is why we always have to remind that all metal hydroxides are bases but ammonium hydroxide also is a base. So these are the three important bases you can remember metal oxides, metal hydroxides, ammonium hydroxide. What are some examples? So metal oxide you can take an example magnesium oxide that is going to be a base, calcium oxide, copper oxide right all these guys are bases, aluminium oxide these can all act as bases right. What about metal hydroxide? Aluminium maybe because it comes under amphoteric so for now I will remove it right but uh, iron oxide, ferric oxide this is a base. What about metal hydroxides? Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, copper hydroxide all these guys are bases. All metal hydroxides of course in chemistry there are some one or two exceptions here and there but the general rule all metal oxides, all metal hydroxides and ammonium hydroxide these are all bases. Where are bases used? Acid you know it's, uh, it's there in the juice, it's used in tomato sauce and all. In this picture you can see these are soap bars. These are basically soap bars, bars of soap right. So bases are used in soaps. So tomorrow when you are taking bath remind you, yourself you are using a base. So they basically contain soap bars typically contains uh, uh, they are made from sodium hydroxide so they contain sodium stearate uh, your liquid soap typically contains potassium hydroxide okay so soaps are made from bases. So this is one very interesting thing uh, sometimes you will see this is not given clearly in your book in some of the books uh, they have this thing so I am going to teach this concept basicity of an acid what does this mean it sounds very funny right. Normally we should say acidity of an acid. What is basicity of an acid? Look at the definition carefully. Basicity of an acid is it's a very simple definition. It is the number of hydronium ions. The number of hydronium ions that can be produced by one molecule of the acid. Of course in aqueous solution you will dissolve it in water. Okay. So the number of hydronium ions that can be produced by one molecule of the acid when dissolved in water. So let's understand this uh, with an example who is this guy HNO3 you might have heard of him he is basically nitric acid. When you take nitric acid and you dissolve it in water can you guys predict what is going to happen here. So very similar to the equation we did earlier HCl plus water you know it breaks down. So how will nitric acid break down you can divide it like this this is basically nitric acid is H plus and NO3 minus. So this H plus will jump to water and combine with it so it is going to form very simple you can predict this reaction H3O plus plus NO3 minus right all you need to do is break those guys. So if you look here carefully one molecule of nitric acid HNO3 the name is nitric acid 
one molecule of nitric acid is producing how many hydronium ions and see equation is balanced you guys can check the number of atoms see it is producing one hydronium ion so what is the basicity of nitric acid according to the definition if one molecule produces one hydronium ion we can say basicity of nitric acid is basically one base it has basicity of one it's like a it's like a this valency number right it has a power of one what about sulfuric acid if you take one molecule of sulfuric acid what will happen again you break down sulfuric acid there are two h plus over here and there is sulfate is two minus so what will happen those two h pluses will combine there's lots of water so what will happen is they will form two hydronium ions why because this is getting split up like this it is producing two h pluses and a sulfate ion these two h pluses go to water and produce two hydronium molecule uh, ions and a sulfate ion this is all happening in water do you agree so what can you see here one molecule one molecule of sulfuric acid is producing two ions of hydronium so what is its basicity the basicity should be two basically what we are trying to show in this equation is that when you take the acid and you dissolve it in water how many hydronium ions is it producing one simple technique here is you break it down into its ions so nitric acid produces one h plus ion and a nitrate ion that h plus ion goes and combines with the water to produce one hydronium ion so see one molecule of nitric acid produces one hydronium so we say its basicity or its power is one in sulfuric acid it does not produce an h2 it produces two h plus ions there two h plus is produced those two h pluses go to water and produce two hydronium ions right plus a sulfate ion so do you guys agree that the basicity here is going to be two and please check is your equation balanced so you should make sure your equation is balanced it is actually not balanced because if you need two hydrogen ions you need two water molecules to produce those two hydroniums because remember we saw how is hydronium produced by combination of h plus and water that's it so basicity of sulfuric acid is two so in the second equation what is happening is that these two h pluses are going so if you didn't understand it this way another way is you can break it down you can go step by step so you can say that hey one of the h plus so you can break it down into two steps you can say first the h plus combined with the water to produce an h3o plus and what is the remaining part hso4 bisulfate is a negative ion hso4 minus okay this is the first step then what happens in the second step hso4 is still there there is still some hydrogen there in the bisulfate or hydrogen sulfate it will combine with water again you split this up this the plus here and this is 2 minus so what will we get as a result of that h plus will combine with water to give h3o plus and sulfate 2 minus so overall what happened is what the equation i showed you that basically what is happening h2so4 is reacting with two water molecules to produce two hydronium ions and a sulfate molecule so basically those two hydrogen atoms in uh, h2so4 are breaking away combining with two molecules of water to produce two hydronium ions so now can you guys tell me what is the basicity of this acids one of course we can do you know we can sit and write those equations and try to predict but is there a easier way the main trick is you need to see how many replaceable hydrogens are there or basically how many hydrogens are ready to leave the acid that is the basicity because if you look here in nitric acid one hydrogen was ready to leave the acid combined with water to produce hydronium so its basicity was one in sulfuric acid both the hydrogen say we are ready to leave you right and combined with water so they produce two hydronium basicity is two now the question is who is this guy ch3coh this guy is basically acetic acid the one found in vinegar in acetic acid one thing is very interesting only one hydrogen is replaceable only one hydrogen only this outside guy not these guys they are tightly bound to carbon so what happens is when this reacts with water it produces ch3coo minus and only one hydronium so that is why we say basicity is how much one 
because one molecule is producing only one hydronium ion in spite of it having four hydrogen atoms. So don't be fooled by counting hydrogen atoms or oh, one, two, three, four, basis it is four. No, it is only one. When basicity is 1, we say it is monobasic. This is called monobasic. Mono means 1. What about the next one? H3PO4. That is called phosphoric acid. So you need to learn these names, guys. H3PO4 is called phosphoric acid. And this, when combined with water, or if you break it down, it basically ends up producing 3H plus ions and phosphate ions. And these will of course combine with water to form hydronium. So here basicity, I've just written it in the simplified form. Basicity is 3. This is tri-basic. What about the last one? H3PO3. This one is called phosphoric acid. This one is called phosphorus acid. Phosphorus acid. Here it is very interesting. Phosphorus acid has a different type of structure. Its structure is phosphorus combined with there are two OH over here and so see three oxygens and there is one hydrogen here. Phosphorus has valency of 5 and this is how the structure looks like. In this the interesting thing is only these two hydrogens are replaceable. Only two replaceable hydrogens. So here the basicity is going to be 2. It is dibasic. So please do not be fooled by the number of hydrogens. It depends on how many hydrogens are actually replaceable. So these are famous questions that acetic acid, what is its basicity? Uh, even though it has four hydrogens, why is it not tetrabasic? Because only one replaceable. Same way phosphorus acid, only dibasic. So the difficult thing is you can't predict it. You have to learn it up, right? You need to know how many hydrogen atoms will come out. Just like you have basicity of an acid, it's funny, you don't have basicity of base, it is called acidity of base. So why these funny names? Because base neutralizes acid, right? So that is why we use the term acidity of the base. And here it is exactly the opposite of basicity. It is basically how many hydroxyl ions, OH minus, OH minus is called hydroxyl. So how many OH minus ions one molecule of the base is producing, that is called the acidity of the base, okay? So for example, here if you take sodium hydroxide and you put it in water. Similarly, you take calcium hydroxide and put it in water. How will it break down? This is, uh, so this one is actually simpler because you know sodium hydroxide breaks down as Na plus and OH minus. Similarly, for calcium hydroxide, Ca2 plus and OH minus. So what's going to happen here? Sodium hydroxide is going to produce sodium ions and hydroxyl ions. Calcium hydroxide is going to produce calcium and hydroxyl but because there is two hydroxyl it is going to produce two OH minus ions both the hydroxyls will come out. So can you guys tell me what are the acidity of these bases? One molecule producing one ion. There one molecule producing two ions. So here we can say acidity is one. This is monoacidic base. We say this is a monoacidic base. Because it is having a power of 1, it produces 1 OH- minus to neutralize right, the acid. Similarly here, acidity is 2. This is basically diacidic base. Clear? Only the names are a little confusing. It is not monobasic. It is called monoacidic base. How can we classify acids? You might have heard of this classification. Acids can be classified as organic and inorganic. Organic means these are coming from nature, right? occurring in nature. Uh, like lemon juice, orange juice, right? Or uh, lemons, orange, they contain citric acid or you have all your vinegar, right? These are all your organic acids and opposite is called inorganic or mineral. So what are some examples here? So you, you need to learn some examples. So mineral acid, the examples are which are found in rocks and minerals like uh, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid and usually these are the strong acids typically. Right? Except for carbonic acid, which is the weak acid. Rest are all typically the strong ones. Hydrochloric acid is very interesting. It is considered mineral acid because it is found in rocks and minerals. Plus it is found in our stomach. So don't say it is organic. Because it is also found in the rocks and minerals, it is in the inorganic. And here, organic examples are basically your citric acid, acetic acid, all these acids found in fruits, you know. 
and we usually eat these acids. They are weaker acids. So that is why we will be coming to that. It is for the alkalis, the bases which are soluble in water. That's why I want you guys to watch the basic videos. Today I am doing the more difficult concepts which lot of students don't understand clearly. Uh, for these basic kind of things, you can watch the videos on that. So just like we can say organic, inorganic, we can also classify acids as strong and weak acids. So weak acids is usually all the mineral acids, right? Like HCl, H2SO4, HNO3. Exception is carbonic acid, right? Carbonic acid comes under uh, weak acid, even though it is mineral. So even here you have carbonic acid is a weak acid, which is a mineral acid. Usually the weak acids you have eat, uh, you have had, you have eaten it. Have Do you know where carbonic acid you have uh, you've had or you've drunk carbonic acid? Can you guys tell me? So in the, the carbonic acid is what you drink in the aerated drinks, the soda drinks, right? They basically contain your carbonic acid. That is why you see that fizz because carbonic acid is made by carbon dioxide and water. And it's obviously a weak acid since you are having it, right? These are strong acids are very dangerous. HCl, H2SO4, HNO3, we should not even touch them. They can corrode our skin, right? Uh, make the skin black and cause uh, this kind of, you know, uh, corrosion in the skin. So they are highly dangerous. Now, what makes an acid strong or weak? It's not like did it come from nature or not, right? What makes it strong or weak? Again, reminding you that how what makes something an acid? It is not just the hydrogen present in it. Otherwise, water would also be a, would also be an acid, right? Water is not an acid. It is basically that if you take any acid like HCl, it breaks down in water to produce H plus and Cl minus ions. See, I'm writing the simple equation. I can also write it as plus water and show hydronium. I'm just showing the simplified equation. Similarly, if you take acetic acid, again it will break down to give H plus and acetate ions. Right? Who is strong or weak? It depends on how much it breaks down or what we call as degree of dissociation. So basically think about this. Let's say in a solution you have 100 molecules of HCl and 100 molecules of acetic acid in two separate glasses. Okay, So you have taken 100 molecules of HCl, imagine you have 100 molecules of acetic acid. When you dissolve it in water, so when these guys are put in water, what the scientists have observed is that HCl almost 100% breaks down or 99% it breaks down and produces a lot of H plus ions. But acetic acid on the other hand they found it is only producing let's say 20% it breaks down. Remaining is not broken down or we say undissociated. So what does the strength depend on? It basically depends on the, this classification depends on degree of dissociation. How much the acid breaks in water? That means if it breaks a lot in water, it will produce a high concentration of H plus or a high concentration of hydronium ions, right? H plus and water, then it will become a strong acid. But if an acid produces very less H+, even though it has lots of hydrogen, it's not producing H+, it will be having a low concentration. Is that clear? And this degree of dissociation is typically denoted by the symbol alpha. So what is the general rule? That if degree of dissociation is greater than 30%, then it is a strong acid. If degree of dissociation is less than 30%, it is a weak acid. So usually you'll see in the books 30%, 20%, this kind of number is given. So basically if it almost fully dissociates like strong acid, they almost break down completely, right? 9900%. So that is when they are strong acids. So strong acid is a strong acid because it is having a high concentration, high concentration of H3O plus ions. Okay. And this one is having a weak acids have a low concentration of hydronium ions. So since you guys are in class 10, typically you should use the word hydronium. Avoid the word H plus ion because you guys are in class 10. That is the simplified form. The real form is H plus combines with water. But just to explain it simply, many times you'll see in the books, it is also written in terms of H plus. But when you're writing your answers, this is an important tip. Please write hydronium H3O plus ions. Okay. One important thing to remember, all acids are uh, pretty much all the acids are soluble in water. So any acid you can easily dissolve in water. But bases, the very few bases, did you know? Very few bases actually dissolve in water or they are soluble in water. 
what are those bases which are soluble in water it's a very small list it is basically sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide calcium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide these guys are soluble in water these are soluble bases and they are known as the alkalies so bases which are soluble in water are called alkalies that's why you might have heard of the term alkaline solution when you dissolve a base in water if it's soluble it is called an alkali the solution is called alkaline in nature but most of the bases are not soluble in water for example so most of the bases that you have they are insoluble in water like if you take copper hydroxide zinc hydroxide fer ferrous hydroxide ferric hydroxide all these guys all insoluble in water aluminium hydroxide all these metal hydroxides and their corresponding oxides also copper oxide will not dissolve zinc oxide will not dissolve iron oxide will not dissolve fe2o3 will not dissolve aluminium oxide does not dissolve okay these are all insoluble so most of the bases are actually falling into this category most of the things so we should write that here most bases are actually insoluble how are these soluble ones formed by dissolving sodium oxide in water potassium oxide in water calcium oxide in water and this is a separate one ammonia and water there is one exception here which you should know sometimes magnesium hydroxide so magnesium hydroxide is actually in the middle why do i say he is in the middle because he is basically semi soluble this base is semi soluble so sometimes you will see him with the alkali list sometimes with the insoluble so you can learn what is given in your book but typically these are your uh, alkalies but one thing remember all acids are soluble in water so all acids are soluble in water so this is the technique how to identify the acid or base using the formula we know that metal oxides metal hydroxides and ammonium hydroxide are uh, are bases right so that is one way acid you will usually see it with the example hydro hcl h2so4 so as you see the formulas you will learn and you will know that hey these guys are the acids okay now bases also just like acids can be classified strong weak bases also we can say strong weak classification so typically again usually in your books you will see the bases that they are involved in uh, involved with are usually the hydroxides right and see again i've taken the example of magnesium hydroxide because it is semi soluble so you guys should know that who are the strong uh, bases strong bases are sodium hydroxide potassium calcium hydroxide and these are again if you take concentrated solution of these these are highly corrosive in nature right so in soap they are found in very mild form or mixed with an acid which will neutralize it so these are the very strong bases they are highly corrosive and dangerous and these are the weak or the mild bases magnesium hydroxide ammonium hydroxide magnesium hydroxide you might have know known that when you have acidity you know this magnesium hydroxide is the milk of magnesia that you drink to neutralize the acid in your stomach well that is in milk of magnesia ammonium hydroxide you might know it is used in window cleaning it's a window cleaning agent and the sodium hydroxide it is used in manufacture of soap potassium hydroxide in manufacture of liquid soap calcium hydroxide you know it is used uh, slake lime is used for white washing right of the walls so there are various uses of these strong bases now again can you tell me again bases means we are looking at the alkalies here can you tell me what makes the base strong or weak can you guess it on the answer based on acids so again it is based on the degree of dissociation so if you take for example if you take sodium hydroxide okay and you take let's say uh, ammonium hydroxide when you take these two guys both are bases alkalies right when you dissolve them in water both want to break down so it breaks down into sodium plus oh minus this guy will break down into ammonium nh4 plus and oh minus now what makes sodium hydroxide so strong because it will almost again 100% or 99% break down so you will get a 99% oh minus here maybe you'll get only 20% so it is again the degree of dissociation so the important thing here is this will produce a high concentration high concentration of oh minus ions what is the name of oh minus ions guys they are called hydroxyl ions and this will produce a low concentration of oh minus ions 
So remember again, usually we'll be studying about the alkalis. Alkalis means hydroxyl ions are produced by these bases which have been dissolved in water. Here low concentration for the weak bases, here high concentration for the strong bases. And it is all related to, again it is based on degree of dissociation, just like acids. It is based on the degree of dissociation. How much does it break down to produce ions? Very important concept. So anytime they ask you, this is one trick in the exam, anytime they ask you, why is this guy strong, why is this guy weak, whether it's acid or base, it basically the answer is degree of dissociation. For acids, what will you write? High concentration of hydronium or low concentration of hydronium. For alkalis, what will you write? High concentration of hydroxyl or low concentration of hydroxyl ion, OH minus ion. Now something very simple, you might have heard of this concentrated and dilute acid, right? What is the meaning of uh, concentrated and dilute? Dilute means there is less acid, more water. Concentrated is the opposite, more acid, less water, right? So if you take concentrated acid and you add water, you are obviously diluting it. Similarly, if you take concentrated alkali, you add water, you are diluting it, clear? One interesting thing is when you do this reaction, heat is produced. A reaction which is produces heat, what is it known as? Can you guys tell me? These reactions which produce heat, they are called exothermic. Now, why is this so important? Because this famous question comes when you want to dilute it. Dilute means when you want to add water. Should you add water to the acid or acid to water? This is a very important point. When you dilute the acid, what should you do? So, if you have got a container of acid and you say, I want to dilute it. Should you add acid to water or water to... Uh, water to the acid what should you do the answer is you should not add water to acid water should be here and you should be pouring in the acid why why this is the case because of this exothermic when you add acid to water it produces a lot of heat right it it sort of makes that sound a lot of heat is released so when lot of heat is produced here why you want water to be there? Because water has high heat capacity. It acts as a coolant, right? We throw water to make things cool. It feels cool in summer. It absorbs heat. So water has this high heat capacity. It can absorb heat and it can take away the heat. But acid can't do that. And if you add, start adding water to acid, what will happen? It will heat up and it may spurt on your face, right? It is highly dangerous. So this is where science knowledge comes into play. If you are diluting it, you will not add uh, water to the acid, you will add acid to water. Very famous question. Another important point is we should constantly be stirring this. Why? Because you are spreading out the heat, right? You don't want it to be concentrated, otherwise that can also spurt out. So you have to mix it and stir constantly to dissipate, distribute the heat. How do you prepare acids, guys? So acids can be prepared. One is very simple method by synthesis. Synthesis means combination reaction. Hydrogen and non-metal will give you an acid. So if you take H2 plus Cl2, again I want you guys to learn to predict the reaction. H2 plus Cl2, very simple, what will it form? Combination of hydrogen and chlorine, that is HCl, right? Hydrochloric acid or if it's in gaseous form, it is called hydrogen chloride. Don't forget to balance it. There you go. So when you dissolve this in water, it will give hydrochloric acid. In gaseous form, it is called hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen and sulfur, when they combine, what do they form? This rotten smelling gas, hydrogen sulfide, see? So acids can be formed simply by combination reactions. You can also form acids by dissolving the acidic oxide in water. Like if you take sulfur dioxide and water, what will you get? You can predict it, just combine it. So let me copy this H2, there will be sulfur. How many oxygens? 2 plus 1, 3, H2SO3. Do you guys know the name of this acid? Let's finish these equations and you guys tell me the name. If you take sulfur trioxide and water, again play Lego, just combine it, H2SO4, see just join the atoms, 3 plus 1, 4 oxygen, carbon dioxide plus water, again just join it, H2CO3, do you guys know the name of these acids? This one you know I think, H2SO4 is called sulfuric acid, this one we just talked about, H2CO3 which is found in your aerated drink sodas, this is called carbonic acid, right? What about the first one? H2SO3. What is the name of this? Who can tell me the name of the first one? So in chemistry, the rule is ic means more oxygen. Us means less, like phosphoric, phosphorus. We saw that 
H3PO4, H3PO3. Us is less oxygen, ik is higher. Just like valency, ferrospheric, right? So less oxygen atoms because this has four, this has three. This will be called sulfurous acid. So remember all these interesting tricks, right? That will help you remember it. You're not memorizing. Us means less, ik means more. Similarly, can you guys try this one? P2O5 plus water. What will I get? Phosphorus pentoxide plus water. I will get H3PO4, phosphoric acid. Can you guys balance this equation for me? So how can you quickly balance? Again, do the heat and trial. Two phosphorus, one phosphorus. Let's multiply by two. Phosphorus is done. Hydrogen three times two, six. I'll multiply by three here. Hydrogen done. Oxygen, how much? Four times two, eight. Five plus three, eight. Done. So always try to balance the easy elements first. Next one, N2O5 plus H2O. N2O5 is what? Nitrogen pentoxide, just like phosphorus pentoxide. Do you guys know what will be the answer here? So this one will form your nitric acid, HNO3. Again, balance it. So you can see two nitrogen. There's one nitrogen here. If you multiply by two, I think that should bal balance it out. NO3 is nothing but HNO3 is nitric acid. The last one is very interesting. NO2, just like CO2 is carbon dioxide, NO2 is called nitrogen dioxide. This is a reddish brown gas. When you dissolve it in water, what does it form? You might be thinking, okay, again, the same nitric acid, right? You might be thinking, hey, it's going to form HNO3 again. But this is very interesting. It actually forms two acids, HNO3 and HNO2. Can you guys give me the name of these acids? This one we just said, this is nitric acid. This one, now you can guess the name. One oxygen I took away. So it should be called nitrous acid, less oxygen. That is why this is called, it is called a mixed anhydride. There is another term here. These guys on the left, these guys are called acid anhydrides. The acidic oxides that you dissolve in water, these are called, there is a term here, these are called acid anhydride. Why? Because when you add water, you get the acid. Or you say, you remove water, you get the anhydride. Anhydride, you have taken away the water. So these are all called acid anhydrides. They are used, when you dissolve it in water, it produces the acid. This guy is special. He is called a mixed anhydride. And you can guess now why. Why is nitrogen dioxide a mixed anhydride? Because it produces a mixture of two acids. Not one acid, it produces two acids. So similarly, a question can come. To, uh, you can be asked this question. Who is the acid anhydride of nitric acid? Can you guys tell me based on this slide? So the acid anhydride of nitric acid is N2O5, not NO2, not NO2 guys. Because see, it gives a mixture of two acids. So this is the acid anhydride. So N2O5 is the acid anhydride of HNO3. So this is another important concept you have learned. Acid anhydride means when you mix that substance with water, it will produce the acid for you. Clear? Now, another way you can prepare acids is by oxidation of the non-metals. How do you do that? By using an acid which is a strong oxidizing agent like nitric acid. So, let's say you take sulfur and concentrated nitric acid or phosphorus and concentrated nitric acid. So, here what is the uh, trick over here that nitric acid, actually if you take concentrated nitric acid, it breaks down to give you H2O, NO2 and nascent oxygen. Okay, That's what concentrated nitric acid does. If you take dilute nitric acid, that also gives you H2O, NO and nascent oxygen. Okay, So what happens here, if you take sulfur and concentrated nitric acid, it's going to, this nascent oxygen is going to attack sulfur and make it sulfur dioxide. Then sulfur dioxide will again be attacked by nascent oxygen. It will become sulfur trioxide. Then it will dissolve in the water, right, and become sulfuric acid. So finally, what you'll be getting over here, so basically the steps will be sulfur plus nascent oxygen will give you sulfur dioxide. Again, you add nascent oxygen to that, you'll get sulfur trioxide. And then sulfur trioxide plus water will give you sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So this is what's going to happen. Okay. So finally, the acid that we are going to be left with here is sulfuric acid H2SO4 plus water plus nitrogen dioxide NO2. 
Okay, so this is what uh, sulfur nitric concentrated nitric acid does. You get sulfuric acid. Uh, how do you uh, when you react with phosphorus and concentrated nitric acid? What do you think we are going to get? We are going to get again water and NO two, and the acid formed here. Any guesses? What is the acid going to be formed here? It's going to be phosphoric acid H three PO four. So what you are going to end up over here is H three PO four phosphoric acid plus water plus NO two. Again, I am not balancing these equations. I am leaving them unbalanced. You guys can practice the balancing of it because our goal right now is to predict and learn how how we can write these reactions. Another way to prepare acids is by displacement of the salts. Okay, so by doing the you take a salt and you take a acid which is less volatile. Like for example, if you take sodium chloride and sulfuric acid. Okay, what will it give you? So what's going to happen over here? The hydrogen is going to be displaced from this. By the way, this arrow is very low. So this is another way to pr uh, prepare. Let's say you want to prepare hydrochloric acid. So what do you do? You take sodium chloride and sulfuric acid, and then you heat it. So what's going to happen in this? The displacement will be one of the hydrogen is going to go to chlorine, and that is going to give you HCl. And the remaining you are going to be left with is sodium bisulfate plus HCl. This is if you do the reaction at less than 200 degrees Celsius. If you do the reaction at more than 200 degrees Celsius, then all the hydrogen will go away. You will get sodium sulfate plus HCl. Similarly, over here, sodium nitrate and H2SO4. So this is going to end up <laughs> giving you again sodium bisulfate plus nitric acid. Clear? Clear? So this is the displacement going on where one hydrogen is getting uh, used up. Uh, uh, is getting uh, you know shifted from uh, sulfuric acid to nitric acid, and here we say typically we use sulfuric acid because it is less volatile. What is the meaning of the word less volatile? It does not change easily from liquid to gaseous state, right? Like perfumes are very volatile. They'll easily, if you open the perfume bottle, it'll easily change from liquid to gas or petrol, very volatile. But usually, when we are preparing a Less volatile acid, uh, a more volatile acid, we use a less volatile acid because otherwise, if you heat it and if all the sulfuric acid escapes as a gas, then there's no use, the reaction will not occur. Okay, so this is another way to prepare acids. The other very uh, important way to prepare acid is by using a metal plus an acid, right? Uh, oh, so here we have done. So this was till the preparation of acids. Now we are going to go to the reactions, right? Do we need to memorize the word equation? The word equation helps you see the pattern. Salt plus less volatile acid will give you the salt plus the more volatile. You don't have to memorize this. It helps you actually to remember what is the reaction given. Now, next, let's proceed to the chemical properties of the acids. Chemical properties basically means chemical reactions. So the first and very famous one that we're going to look at is reaction of metals with the acid. So if you take a metal like, let's say, zinc, magnesium, manganese, right? What will be the reaction with the acid? So let's say you take zinc and sulfuric acid. What is that going to do? Zinc is more reactive than hydrogen. So it's going to displace it. So what salt will we get? Zinc sulfate plus hydrogen. Simple. All of you can see what is happening. Zinc is kicking out the hydrogen over here. So what type of reaction is this? These are all basically displacement reaction or single displacement. Do you guys agree? So this is the reaction. The next one, can you tell me magnesium plus HCl? Can you guys predict this for me? Magnesium plus HCl. Again, the same thing. Magnesium is going to kick out hydrogen here. And will it give me this? Is this the right reaction? MgCl plus H2? No, whenever you're writing formulas, you have to use the balancing. Magnesium has balance C2. So it will be Mg, MgCl2 plus H2. And again, you should balance your equation. So this one is simple to balance. 2 HCl. Next one, manganese plus nitric acid. So nitric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. So usually it does not end up giving hydrogen. It usually ends up giving, you know, magnesium nitrate, water and those nitrogen oxides like we did. But with magnesium and manganese, if you take 1% very dilute, dilute and cold nitric acid, then you get this similar behavior of salt, which is going to be manganese nitrate plus hydrogen gas, right? So you're going to get this simple reaction if you take manganese or magnesium. So this is important. Only two metals can react with 
1% dilute cold nitric acid to give you salt and hydrogen. The remaining metals will end up producing salt, water and the nitrogen oxides. Another reaction of acids is that they react with bases or alkalis. What is the meaning of alkali? Bases which are soluble in water to form salt and water. This is the very famous reaction you have heard of. Acid plus base gives salt plus water. Can you guys tell me what is this reaction, famous reaction known as? Can you tell me what is the name? Very good. The correct answer is neutralization reaction. I think English and uh, Indian and British spelling is with an S. American spelling, they use a Z. So please use whatever your book is using. This is basically your neutralization reaction. Acid plus base gives salt and water or alkali plus acid gives salt and water. So now can you guys easily predict this? When you look at this, oh, KOH, this is an alkali. Copper oxide, it doesn't dissolve in water, so it's a base. And here we have these acids. So obviously we can see that, ah, this is an acid plus base reaction, so it's a neutralization. It is going to give us salt plus water. So can you guys predict the answer for me? Very simple. These are all, you know, like the double displacement reactions because the if you break it down, plus minus, plus minus, you guys can see the potassium is going to go to sulfate to form potassium sulfate. And please combine it according to valency. Valency of sulfate is 2, potassium is 1, so it is K2SO4. H and OH combine to form water, so plus H2O. Similarly for this one, copper oxide plus HCl, again they'll combine according to their valencies. The salt we are going to get is CuCl2. Copper usually carries its valency of 2 plus H2O. Again, you can easily do this by breaking this down into plus minus, right? So copper, uh, copper and oxygen here. So copper and chlorine, hydrogen and oxygen. Clear? How we predicted this reaction? Similarly, you can predict other neutralizations. What are other chemical properties of acids? They react with metal carbonate and bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide gas. So what is the meaning of bicarbonate? Bicarbonate basically means hydrogen carbonate. So let's see how we can uh, easily predict this. Again, let me show you a very simple technique. So let's say you take sodium carbonate and an acid. Again, it is a double displacement. Please break it down like this. Plus, minus. Do all this in rough work. Please don't show all these secret tricks. Okay. Do it in rough work and or erase it out. Do it in pencil. So again, what do you need to do? Combine the sodium and the chlorine. So that will give you positive negative will combine sodium chloride. Then combine the hydrogen and carbonate. So that will give us, what is this called? Can you guys tell me? So we have got salt and H2CO3. What is it known as? Very good. This is carbonic acid. H2CO3 is carbonic acid. Where have we seen carbonic acid? In our aerated drinks, the Coca-Cola, Pepsi you have, that basically contains carbonic acid. Why? Because they have compressed carbon dioxide into it. They have dissolved a lot of carbon dioxide into the aerated drink. So it's carbon dioxide and water. Carbonic acid is unstable. right? So it doesn't usually like to remain at carbonic acid. It quickly breaks down into water and carbon dioxide. That is why you know that when you open that Coca-Cola or Pepsi can, you get that psh sound, right? Is the carbon dioxide coming out? Okay. Because carbonic acid is breaking down, right? They've pushed in a lot of carbon dioxide into the uh, can or into the bottle, right? And so when it breaks down, so that is why we don't write H2CO3. We break it down and write it as H2O plus CO2. And that is how you can see that it releases carbon dioxide gas. So any carbonate you react with acid, it produces a salt, water and carbon dioxide gas. Similarly, for the bicarbonate, and again, please balance these equations just to save time. I'm not balancing it. So here, positive, negative. Similarly, here, potassium bicarbonate. Potassium is the positive. Bicarbonate is the negative. So when you guys combine this, what will you get? Potassium and chlorine will combine to form potassium chloride. Okay. H and HCO3 will again form carbonic acid, H2CO3. But that quickly breaks down into water and carbon dioxide. So what we are going to end up with is H2O plus CO2. So very good question. We should not write H2CO3. So that is the secret. It is finally giving us H2CO3. But we should not write it because 90-95% it breaks down and it releases carbon dioxide gas which goes out you know, into the atmosphere. So you, should not, you can do that in rough work but you should end it like this. Okay. Do not write H2CO3. Clear? So this is how we predict the reaction, right? If you remember this technique, so I'll tell you in my school days, I never memorized this. I would easily predict it based on this logic. Plus, minus, oh, sodium chloride, H2CO3, that breaks down. Potassium bicarbonate, uh, HCl, 
So you give me any acid, any any bicarbonate, carbonate, we can easily predict this. We don't have to memorize these reactions. Similarly, see, for the sulfites also, we can do that. Even if you don't read the rule, let's try this. You have got calcium sulfide, HCl. Everybody, pick up your pen and paper. Do this plus minus. Break it down. Positive gets attracted to negative. Positive to negative again. So what will we get here? Calcium and chlorine. But please don't write CaCl. Use the valency. Calcium chloride, CaCl2. Sulfite has valency 2. So it will give me H2SO3. What is the name of this guy? Can anybody name this guy for me? Who is H2SO3? Guys, this is not sulfuric acid. This is sulfurous. Sulfuric is H2SO4. Everybody knows. But one oxygen less. Remember I told you, us means less oxygen. Ik means more oxygen. This is sulfurous acid. Again, how to predict this reaction? Sulfurous acid is just like carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is H2CO3. H2SO3 quickly breaks down to give you H2O plus SO2. Remember, this was the acid anhydride of it. If you dissolved it in water, you got H2SO3. So it is breaking down into water and it's acid anhydride. And that is why the answer will be H2O plus SO2. And this is your gas sulfur dioxide. So guys, you can predict these equations. You don't have to memorize them. You just follow this plus minus technique. Only thing you have to remember, I should not end my answer with H2CO3 or H2SO3. It will break down further. That's it. Similarly for the bisulfite, okay? Sodium bisulfite, look here. Again, come on, pick up your pen and paper, do this. This is a really important trick to understand what is happening here. Now combine sodium and chlorine, NaCl. Valency is one, so I obviously I'll not write NaCl2. H and HSO3, it will give me H2SO3. Write this and then remember, ah, we discussed this in class that it is going to break down. H2O plus SO2. Done, done, done. Again, to save time, I'm not balancing these equations, you know. You guys can balance. These are quite easy to balance. Like if you look at the first one, there is Cl2, there is H2. I think if I put a 2 here, it's going to get balanced. Anhydride means those uh, compounds like uh, carbon dioxide is the acid anhydride of H2SO3. You take carbon dioxide plus water, it gives you H2CO3. SO3 is the acid anhydride of H2SO4. SO3 plus water, H2SO4, right? So the compound which you dissolve in water, when it gives the acid, that compound is called its acid anhydride. So you guys can see that with metal sulfites, again, sulfite is not sulfate, sulfite is SO3s. And the bisulfites or the hydrogen sulfides, you get sulfur dioxide gas. Clear? What is the observation of sulfur dioxide gas? It is a pungent smelling gas. It has the smell of burnt sulfur. So all these things you have to remember. Next, it reacts with the metal sulfides to form hydrogen sulfide. Again, I'll show you how to predict this. Very easy. Don't learn these. Plus, minus, plus, minus. All of you try. Same way here. Plus, minus, plus, minus. You can easily predict this. Zinc and chlorine, ZnCl2. Hydrogen and sulfur, H2S. There you go. You want to balance it? Put a 2 here, I think. Done. FeS plus H2SO4. What will be the answer? Ferrous sulfate. Hydrogen and sulfur, H2S. What is the property of this H2S? H2S is a gas, right? You can write G or you can put the up arrow. Observation is what? Pun, uh, it has the smell of rotten eggs, right? Rotten egg smelling gas. I remember when we used to do uh, in our school days, this chemistry lab experiments with H2S gas. It was horrible smell, right? Because it releases a rotten egg smelling gas. So you guys confident how we can predict this? If they give you any sulfide, so you can see these are all working out to be double displacements, plus minus, plus minus, exchange the ions and you're done. Next, reaction with the metal chlorides. So metal chloride, I told you, temperature is important, like we had discussed, if you do below 200 degrees Celsius. Again, here, these are all double displacements. The only difference being, if you do the reaction at a lower temperature, it will give you sodium bisulfate. Only one hydrogen will go and HCl gas. But if you do at a higher temperature, it will give you sodium sulfate and HCl gas, both the hydrogens will go away. This is the reaction below 200 and above 200 degrees. Same thing happens here. Metal chloride, if you do uh, below 200 with the nitrates also, same story. Again, you can do the plus minus here. So that's my goal to teach you how to predict these reactions, guys. So if you do this reaction, what will happen? This will give you potassium bisulfate plus HNO3, just like last time you got HCl. And here you'll get above 200, you'll get all the hydrogen replaced, potassium sulfate and HNO3.
and this is given in the icc textbooks that the reaction is preferred below 200 because what's the problem here one you are wasting fuel also and the potassium sulfate uh, which is formed above 200 it sticks to the glass it spoils the apparatus right and um, the reaction uh, speed slows down so always the preferred is temperature below 200 where it will form the bisulfates sorry guys by mistake we have written metal chloride here it should be metal nitrate so thank you for pointing that out this one should be metal nitrate. So reaction with again uh, metal nitrate, it should not be chloride, metal nitrates to form uh, the nitric acid. So uh, same thing if you take, uh, so see if you guys can predict this reaction. So if you take these uh, metal nitrates like lead nitrate, again you just do the positive negative, plus minus here, same thing here, plus minus, plus minus. So as expected, double displacement will happen. So you'll be getting PbCl2 plus HNO3. Similarly here, you'll be getting PbSO4 plus HNO3. And I think you guys can balance. It will be, I think, 2 here, 2, 2. So we have discussed all the chemical, how to prepare the acids and the chemical properties of acids. Now let's talk about how uh, about the bases. First of all, how we can prepare the bases and then their reactions. So how do you can prepare the bases? Remember, we have discussed what are bases, metal oxides, metal hydroxides, right? And then you also have ammonium hydroxide. So let's talk about uh, how do you prepare a base? It's a simple metal oxide. So many metals are highly reactive with oxygen, like sodium and magnesium. You just heat them, they'll happily react with oxygen. Here, can you tell me, is this the correct formula? Which formula is wrong? Sodium oxide or magnesium oxide? Which one is wrong? Guys, sodium has valency 1, oxygen has valency 2. Don't forget valency crisscross. This is going to be Na2O. Sodium oxide, magnesium oxide is correct. Both have valency 2, magnesium and oxygen. It will cancel. Now you can balance your equation. Uh, so you have 2 oxygen here, only 1. So we'll multiply by 2. We'll multiply by 4 here. This one, I need to multiply by 2 here and 2 here. So can you see these are the bases formed? Because bases we discussed, they are basically the Bases are your metal oxide, metal hydroxides and ammonium hydroxide. Next, you can also prepare the bases by reaction of water and reactive metals. So can you guys predict here for me? Try the first one, sodium plus water, what will it give? Sodium plus water, what will you get? See, again, sodium is going to kick out hydrogen. So let's say you predicted sodium oxide plus hydrogen. Sodium is going to kick out the hydrogen. But will that be the right answer? No, because there's still more water left. So sodium oxide is a alkali. It will easily dissolve in water, right? So it will actually produce for us sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen. So please do not think it will give oxide. Suppose accidentally you thought oxides, then think, oh, that oxide is going to react with water to give me my alkali because sodium hydroxide is a strong alkali, remember? All of you understood why this will not be sodium oxide. Many times this is a common mistake to write sodium oxide because that sodium oxide will again react with water to produce sodium hydroxide. So there is no chance there will be sodium oxide left. How do you balance the first equation? See, sodium is balanced, oxygen already balanced, only irritation is hydrogen. It is 2 here, it is 1, 3 there. So when element is alone, we can easily use the fraction technique half. See, now it's balanced. But I want to get rid of the 2, so I'll multiply by 2 throughout. There you go. For potassium, same story. It is going to give you a KOH. Sodium potassium are like brothers, right? Or sisters. Similar reaction, KOH plus hydrogen. And again, to balance it, it will be the same balancing. They have the same valency. What about the last one? Last one, also same story. Calcium will give you calcium oxide. That will react with water to give you calcium hydroxide. But be careful here, calcium valency is 2. So the reaction will look like this. Now to balance it, you can see that you have to balance oxygen. I need to multiply by 2 here. There's 4 hydrogen. Ah, there's 4 hydrogen done. Guys, this is how you predict the reactions in chemistry. You don't have to memorize these. These are just simple displacement. Hydrogen is being kicked out and you're getting your hydroxides here. Next one. How can you prepare the alkalis? Another option is just what we talked about. You dissolve the oxide, metal oxide in water. You will get your alkali. You have four famous alkalis. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide. Okay. So very simple. Sodium oxide when dissolved in water will give you sodium hydroxide. 
This will give you potassium hydroxide. This will give you calcium hydroxide finished. You guys can easily balance this also for me. I think balancing will be like just put a two here. That will be done. The last one is I think already balanced. There you go. Again, remember what is alkalis? Alkalis are those bases which are soluble in water. Bases which are soluble in water. Because if you do zinc oxide plus water, it's not going to give you zinc hydroxide, right? Because it does not dissolve in it. You can also prepare bases by double decomposition. Again, see the beauty of chemistry, how you can easily predict this reaction. FeCl3 sodium hydroxide. This is a salt. This is a base. Ah, That means I think because it's not like acid base. So maybe let's try double displacement. There's no chance of combination here, decomposition. So for this, just try your double displacement. So what will it give? Fe and OH will combine. So it will give me FeOH, NaCl. But the question is, what is the valency of iron? What val valency of hydroxide is one. Iron is how much valency? Usually the valency, uh, iron has two valencies, paraspheric two and three. But usually the valency on the left is carried on the right. Here you can see this is a ferric chloride, iron with valency three. So it will give me a ferric hydroxide. That's it. Plus NaCl. Again, you can balance out this equation. I think you'll put a 3 here and a 3 here will balance it out. Same story for the next one. Copper and OH will combine to give you copper hydroxide. Copper will carry its same valency of 2. So Cu, OH, hold 2. Na and SO4. But please do not write NaSO4. That will make me really sad. Sulfate has valency 2, sodium has valency 1, so any 2 SO4. Crisscross your valencies. Clear? So can you see we are just switching the, we are just exchanging the ions here, but with the correct valency. It is not just playing Lego. You cannot write FeOH plus NaCl3. You have to write according to the correct valency. Is this clear? Double decomposition, also known as, or double displacement. And you can see we are getting the hydroxides plus the salt. Hydroxide is your base. See, these are your bases. So see, ferrous hydroxide, copper hydroxide, you cannot get by simply dissolving ferrous, uh, ferric oxide in water or copper oxide in water because it's not an alkali. It will not dissolve. So you prepare it by double displacement. This is how you prepare these bases. Next one, by action of oxygen on metal sulfide. So what will happen here? When oxygen reacts with zinc sulfide, now what will happen? Oxygen is highly reactive with zinc and sulfur. So it is going to give me the zinc oxide plus sulfur dioxide. Same for PBS and oxygen. It is going to give me PBO plus sulfur dioxide. Okay. Again, make sure you guys balance this. See, zinc is already balanced. Sulfur is balanced. Only oxygen is not balanced. Oxygen is how many? 2 plus 1, 3 atoms here. Only 2 here. So we'll multiply by 3 by 2 to balance it. To balance the entire thing, let's multiply the entire equation by 2. There you go. Here also you can see lead and sulfur balanced. Oxygen is not balanced. 2 plus 1, 3 atoms over here. So we'll multiply by 3 by 2 fraction technique. See, 3 oxygen is balanced. Now get rid of the fraction. There you go. Done. You can also prepare bases by decomposition of salts. Decomposition means breaking down. So let's say you heat these carbonates. So when you heat and it decomposes, what is it known as? Decomposition under heat. It is called thermal decomposition. Decomposition, what does it mean? One reactant, many products. Okay. So what is it going to break down? Calcium carbonate, right? Marble chalk. When you heat it, it breaks down into calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. See, this is your base, the metal oxide. Similarly, copper carbonate. It breaks down into copper oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. See, this is your base, copper oxide. Clear? So this is how you can also prepare the metal oxides, the bases by heating their carbonates. Metal nitrates. If you heat the metal nitrates, then also you can get a base. Like if you take calcium nitrate or zinc nitrate, it will give you calcium oxide. Plus, it's going to give you these gases, nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. Similarly here, it will give you zinc oxide plus NO2 plus O2. Now make sure your equation is balanced. So again, you can see calcium is 1, 1 balanced. Nitrogen is uh, 
two over here, only one there. So let's multiply by two. How many oxygen here? Three times two is six. How many here? Four, five, six, seven. See, this is where fraction will really help you to balance this fast. How? Because you have three times two, six oxygen here. How many you have on the right side? Two times two, four plus two, six, seven. Now you want how many? Six. But you have a lone oxygen there. You can put whatever fraction you want in front of it. So you have two times two, four plus one, five. You need only one more, but you have two. So if I half it, I'll get it, right? Now you want to get rid of that half. You just multiply the entire equation by two. You're done. See how fast it is. So if you learn this fraction technique, it can help you to balance it very fast. Similarly for the next one, the, since the valency of calcium and zinc is same, you will get the same answer here. Clear? You can also prepare bases. Uh, uh, you have this base ammonia and water. Can you guys tell me what base will you get here? Ammonia is what? Nitrogen and three hydrogen. Nitrogen has valency three, hydrogen one. So, but we write nitrogen first. So, ammonia is NH3 plus water. Can you guys predict what, what base we'll get here? One hydrogen, if you combine here, you get NH4OH. This is ammonium hydroxide. This guy is ammonia gas. Ammonia gas is highly soluble in water. On dissolving in water, it gives you ammonium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide is also a base. Like I told you, the famous alkalis are sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, ammonium hydroxide. Magnesium hydroxide, semi-soluble. Now let's talk about the chemical properties of bases. Chemical properties means chemical reactions. So strong alkalis, we know they react with carbon dioxide to form carbonates. Okay. So what will happen? Like let's say you take sodium hydroxide and carbon dioxide. What will happen? The sodium oxide and carbon dioxide will form to uh, combine to form sodium carbonate plus water. Now, what is a good way to learn this? Because you can see that sodium hydroxide is a base. And carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is not an acid exactly because acid must contain hydrogen. But we know it is acidic gas because when you dissolve it in water, it gives carbonic acid. So you can see finally a base and acidic gas right? A uh, gas which is acidic in nature is bound to give you a salt plus water. So see, it's basically like a neutralization that is happening. Not perfectly a neutralization because this is not an acid. It's an acidic gas. Same thing with potassium hydroxide and carbon dioxide. What will you get? You'll be getting K2CO3 plus water. And of course, you should balance these reactions. Clear? Can you guys see how we are getting a base and acidic gas? So is it making sense? that we are getting a salt and water. If you want to write the state of matter here, what is the state? Let's try it for this one. Potassium hydroxide is soluble in water. So we write aqua state. Carbon dioxide is a gas. So you should write G. Potassium carbonate is soluble in water because all so sodium potassium salts are soluble. So we write AQ. And water itself is a liquid. So there I've written the states of matter also if you want to write them. We know that acid reacts with base to form salt and water. Similarly, same thing, right? Bases will react with acids to form salt and water. This is that famous reaction which we have discussed. Always questions come on this reaction. This is the neutralization reaction. Because acid is neutralizing the base or base is neutralizing the acid. So can you guys uh, work this out for me? Sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid, what will this give? The easiest way again I told you, it is finally like a double displacement. So sodium and sulfate will form the salt sodium sulfate. But carefully think of the valency. Sulfate has valency 2, sodium 1. So it is going to be Na2SO4. H and OH will give you water. Done. There you go. You got your salt and water. What about the next one? Zinc oxide plus HCl. Again, you'll get your salt and water. ZnCl2 plus H2O. Okay. Again, I'm leaving them unbalanced for you because my goal today was to teach you how to predict these reactions, how to understand these reactions so that you don't have to memorize so many of them, right? You can easily predict any of these. This one, let me write it a little more clearly. It's looking like zinc oxide. It's zinc chloride, Cl2. How about this one? Metallic salts when it reacts with alkali. Again, can you predict it? Suppose you have never seen this reaction. Can you predict it? 
See, again, you can see the trick. There's a salt and a base, right? Ammonium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. You try your double displacement. Plus, minus, plus, minus. So what will this give me? Copper and OH will give me, or let's first do ammonium and sulfate. That's going to give me ammonium sulfate. Ammonium has valency 1, sulfate 2. So this whole thing will come under a bracket because NH4 is an ammonium. It's a it's an ion, right? So the whole thing comes under 2. Ammonium sulfate plus what are we left with? Copper and OH. Copper will carry its valency 2. So it is going to be copper hydroxide. We know that copper hydroxide doesn't dissolve in water. So it will precipitate out. In fact, it forms a bluish precipitate, right? So insoluble hydroxide. Can you guys similarly predict the next one? Again, very simple. Break it. Cut these compounds into its positive negative. Zinc is Zn plus. This is the positive radical, negative radical. Again, sodium and hydroxide, positive, negative. Come on, guys. Exchange the ions. So sodium and sulfate will give you Na2SO4 plus uh, you have zinc and OH will give you zinc hydroxide. Again, zinc hydroxide not soluble in water, so it will precipitate out. See, we are getting salt plus insoluble hydroxide. We are getting salts and insoluble hydroxide. Let's try another one. Alkalis warmed with ammonium salt, will they end up giving ammonia? Let's try to predict these ones. So what is the prediction here? Again, we will do double. So you can see many of them are just working with simple double displacement. Okay. So let's do that plus minus, plus minus. What do we get out of here? Ammonium and hydroxide and sodium and chloride. So let me write NaCl first and then I will get NH4OH. But one interesting thing about NH4OH is it is just like your carbonic acid H2CO3 or your sulfurous acid H2SO3. It is unstable. It breaks down into water and ammonia. Remember water and ammonia were used to form it. Ammonia plus water will give you ammonium hydroxide. Similarly, it will break down easily. So the answer is going to be water plus ammonia gas here. Similarly, if you take ammonium sulfate and potassium hydroxide, what will you get? You are going to be getting potassium sulfate, K2SO4. And again, ammonium hydroxide, which is going to break down into water and ammonia. The only final thing you are left to do is to balance it. Like I think the first equation is already balanced. The next one is a K2SO4. So I need to multiply by 2 here. And uh, ammonium is 2. So maybe you need to multiply this by 2 here. You can check how many is the hydrogen balanced. Hydrogen is 4 times 2, 8, 9, 10. And here you can see 6. Uh, and you need, so I think we need to multiply by 2 here. There you go. Done. So hope you guys found this class useful where we did the acids and bases in one shot. We uh, compared the properties of acids and bases. We looked how to prepare acids and bases and their chemical properties as well. And I showed you the tips and tricks on how to predict these chemical reactions. So do check out the other courses on our website. Make sure you have subscribed to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. So stay connected with Manocha Academy and keep learning.